Welcome to This Week in Money. I'm Jim Goddard. Today, Ross Clark from ChartsAndMarkets.com tells us it was a rare week with just about everything on the markets going up in value. You'll mention the one exception. Trends Journal publisher Gerald Salente believes the U.S. is not in a recession, but there is a global slowdown that has to be watched closely. He also looks at interest rates. Wolf Street's Wolf Richter talks about the meltdown in the subprime auto loan sector. There already have been some small lending companies that have been wiped out. Plus, at the end of the show, we'll have company showcase updates from American Manganese CEO Larry Ray, Avon Resources' Jim Pettit, and Craig Goodwin from Naturally Splendid. We'll talk to Ross Clark right after this. Hi, I'm Douglas Mason, President and CEO of Rainy Mountain Royalty Corp, RMO on the TSX Venture Exchange. Rainy Mountain Royalty Corp is a Canadian-based mineral exploration project generator. The company currently holds multiple property interests in Ontario with joint venture partners and is seeking further joint venture partners for other drill-ready properties in our portfolio. For more information, please visit our website at rmroyalty.com or call me at 604-922-2030. Welcome to This Week in Money, the source for market opinions. Here is Jim Goddard. My guest is Ross Clark from chartsandmarkets.com, where you'll find insightful market commentary and timely technical analysis. Welcome back to the show, Ross. Good to be with you, Jim. Ross, you said you just we just had a unique week where it seems everything went up at the same time. It's you know usually you know if ever, if things are going up in terms of one item, it's because they're declining in terms of some other. But you know this was one of those weeks where it was risk on for the equity markets. You've got you know we're up 400 plus points on the Dow at the end of the week, over one percent on the day. Um, same thing with all the broad indices there. You had a few of the staple stocks that uh, had a bit of pressure at the end of the week. But but overall, the stock market is strong. Um, sentiment's now getting high, but not at an extreme. Um, over on the credit side of the equation, uh, bond market is holding in very well here. Um, the yield curve, <clears throat> if you look at the uh, twos minus tens, uh, two-year rates minus ten-year rates, currently sitting at about six minus 16 basis points right now and we you know we haven't seen a major top in the market like 1987 or 90 or 2001 2007 until that curve has gone inverted and then starts to roll over so there's still from a monetary perspective here um the the yield curve would suggest that there you know, for all that we could have some chattering uh, in the market, there's there's no signs of a major reversal um, in the wings right now. And if we go over to the currency side of the equation, which is where you would look to see, okay, uh, if you'd had a, a weak U.S. dollar, you'd have strength in everything else. Uh, well, in this case, for all that Friday was a down day for the dollar index, it had a pretty good week. It was up on the week. And we've got gold up into the 13 and a quarter level. Silver had a pretty good week here. Um, we got oil um, now at the best levels that we've seen this year. And uh, everything seems to have just bounced well off of supports. And, um, you know, all is all is good right now. Well, President Trump and President Xi both said U.S.-China uh, trade talks were going well. Was that a factor? Well, going well, but not, you know, they're, they're not coming to any quick conclusions. I mean, he's now talking about extending the current level of tariffs, the 10%, uh, out for a, a further period, because clearly there are so many things as far as this negotiation is concerned that uh, they're, they're not close at all to having a final agreement. But they're still talking, and as long as you're talking, uh, there's a chance for improvement. Now, and, you know, I think uh, it will become a sell-the-news event when it finally occurs. But but for now, it's, uh, you know, it's a, uh, a light on the horizon that, uh, you know, may get brighter. And hopefully it's, uh, you know, it's not the light at the end of a tunnel. Are President Trump's tax cuts still a factor in the markets? <clears throat> well... Um, I think they were definitely a factor the first part of last year. 
Uh, but uh, anything that was uh, going to be factored into the market is long past us at this point. And um, I think that uh, you know, the uh, when people start to see do their taxes and realize that the cuts aren't as big as that they might have been hoping for, that that's going to be a bit of a disappointment. And you know, clearly when you look at what was happening to retail sales uh, during December, a pretty poor month there. Uh, the, uh, the the retail market out there is still pretty antsy. Uh, if uh, if they're not uh, at ease with uh, the uh, you know what they're seeing in the way of a tax return, I uh, wouldn't be at all surprised that uh, that retail sales number continues to stay on the lower side here. The U.S. did have two weeks with higher jobless claims, something they haven't seen for a long time. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, you know, you can only continue at this good rate for so long, you know, and you know, clearly that the U.S. jobs number started looking good. Uh, you go back to 2009, you know, just uh, as uh, we we're coming out of the uh, out of the U.S. recession. By the time you get out to October, that's where the employment numbers started to look good. And they've been improving right since then, right through the the, the latter half of the Obama administration and through this administration here. But, you know, you can only go so long before uh, the number of uh, jobs out there the, you know, where, you know, they have a reasonable income as far as uh, their wages are concerned uh, can be a benefit to people. Ross, what about the gold market? Is it picking up? Well, uh, gold market, uh, we had some really good overbought readings here just two weeks ago. Uh, upside exhaustions, uh, some sequential readings that we have on our DeMarc uh, analysis, all indicating that there should have been a correction, and we've had the first pullback. We get from 1330 down to 1305. That tested the 20-week average, and we talked about that in the last couple of weeks, that uh, we would be vulnerable probably back to the 20-week could go up to a new high, which it's trying to do right now. And then I think that the next deeper correction that you'll see here uh, in the next month or so will be back more to the 50-day uh, moving average. Then, depending upon how long that takes, uh, it could still be in the 1290-ish range, might be up around 1300. But we are uh, now into the middle of February. You're getting past the real sweet spot as far as the seasonal is concerned for gold. And not only is it the sweet spot, but the length of time in the rally is now uh, getting long in the tooth. So possibility of a correction is there. Uh, the miners have been doing uh, pretty well as a whole. The GDXJ, the juniors, have actually been outperforming the seniors. Um, so uh, I'd keep reasonably tight stops on those. I wouldn't want to risk uh, beyond the lows that we've seen in this last 10 days. Ross, thank you so much for chatting with us. Uh, always nice to be with you, Jim. My guest has been Ross Clark from chartsandmarkets.com. Coming up, Trends Journal publisher Gerald Salente, next on This Week in Money. Always consult your investment professional before making any investment decision. Arctic Star Exploration, operated by a team of proven mine finders, is focused on diamonds in Finland and the Northwest Territories of Canada. Work programs are underway in Finland and Canada. Arctic Star trades on the TSX Venture Exchange symbol ADD, on Frankfurt symbol 82A1, and the OTCQB symbol ASDZF. Please visit our website, arcticstar.ca, or call us at 604-689-1799. Avon Resources Limited is a gold exploration company with significant projects in British Columbia, Saskatchewan, and the Yukon. Trading on the TSX Venture Exchange, symbol ABN, and the pink symbol ABN AF. Surrounded by world-class gold deposits and mines, Avon's 23,000 hectares Forest Kerr Gold Project is located in the heart of the Golden Triangle in northwestern BC. For more information, visit us at avonresources.com. This Week in Money is archived online at talkdigitalnetwork.com. Welcome back to This Week in Money. We're speaking with Gerald Salente, publisher of the Trans Journal online at transjournal.com. He's speaking to us from historic Kingston, New York. Gerald, welcome back to This Week in Money. Always great being on with you. Thanks for having me, Jim. Gerald, you have a brand new issue of the Trans Journal out. Can you tell us what can we find there? Ah, uh, 
you know, from where the economy is going, the big trends in uh, cannabis, which we were among the first to call, uh, just every trend that you could think about from Bitcoin to gold to uh, geopolitics. Matter of fact, that's the cover of what's going on in Venezuela, the coup by the United States. And again, that comes as no surprise to our Trends Journal subscribers because if you go back to the November edition, it was a feature story. We called it the Triangle of Death. And we showed how Brazil, Colombia, and Argentina were forming a triangle to take out Venezuela with, of course, the United States behind it. And that's what's going on now, what the implications are going to be, and many, many other stories in the Trends Journal, which now, of course, has gone from a quarterly to a monthly, and there's no magazine in the world like it. And, Gerald, it's like there's no uh, shortage of things to cover. <laughs> oh, you know, I in our top trends for 2019, I mentioned that get buckle up for a rocky ride into the future. And I've been in this business now, next year will be 40 years, and I've never seen a year like this one. One question I have about Venezuela, why would the, the country block aid shipments? Uh, the aid shipment thing is a, that, that's a propaganda thing. Okay. Uh, so the, so that you could learn to hate the government that's in charge. That's all it is. And, it, and it's so tiny compared, you know, to a, to a country that size, it means absolutely nothing. So it's a propaganda tool. Gerald, is the U.S. headed for recession? Not right away. Uh, we had made a forecast back in September, and we called it, get ready for an economic 9-11, and now we changed that forecast. People ask me, they say, they call me a futurist. I say, I'm not a futurist. Nobody could predict the future. There are too many wild cards. You base your trends on the current events, and the current event going back in September was the Federal Reserve of the United States was going to be aggressively raising interest rates in 2019. Three to four times was the word. And then on January 4th, we heard from the Fed chair, Jerome Powell, saying, well, we're going to be patient. And at the end of January, we heard, well, you know, it doesn't look like we're going to raise rates next year. So that means that they're going to keep lowering rates as we see it. We're forecasting lower interest rates to pump more monetary methadone into the bull because that's the only thing that pulled the world out of the panic of 08 and the Great Recession is unprecedented levels of quantitative easing, zero and negative interest rates. So we don't see a recession around the corner because this is going to temporarily stop it from happening. And not only in the United States, you're seeing now in Australia, they were going to raise rates. Now it looks like they're going to lower them. Canada, well, they just were going to uh, had. They had some very strong job numbers, but they didn't raise rates either. They're still at, what, 1.75, um, you know, nothing. And so it's one country after another. India, they just lowered rates. So we don't see a recession right around the corner. But when it does happen, it'll be not a recession, but the greatest depression, because all they're doing is building up a debt bubble unparalleled in the history of the world. When it happens, will there be any early signs, or will the collapse happen all of a sudden? It's hard to tell. You know, it's a, you can see the signs coming. You look at the real estate market. That's a, that's a stage one recession element. And then, of course, jobs. And then you start looking at slowering GDP. It usually doesn't happen all at once, but then you start adding up. Where is it going down? What are commodity prices doing? How about the shipping, the Baltic Dry Index? What's going on with that? So you look at many different aspects to see what's going on. And then it could be a big bank or a large company or a war in the Middle East where oil prices spike to $100 a barrel or above. So it could be any kind of wild card plus the regular economic fundamentals. Even if interest rates are lowered, is there any guarantee the banks will not constrict credit? The banks will do anything they can to keep the Ponzi scheme going. I mean, you're already looking at the numbers coming out here in the States, how the people that are late on their uh, car payments, now it's back to a 10-year high. And 
look at the subprime autos and you equal it to subprime real estate. Of course, the numbers in autos are a lot smaller. And you start so, you, but the banks are, you know, they're they're uh, only interested in making money. And that's why whoever came up with the term subprime, they'll loan to whoever they can for as long as they can until the Ponzi scheme ends. Is the U.S. interest in Venezuela to keep China from getting a foothold in South America? I think the primary interest of the United States interest in Venezuela is the same interest they have in the Middle East with countries like Libya and Iraq. And that's their broccoli crops. They have huge broccoli crops. And No, it's oil. It's all it is. It's oil. Venezuela is sitting on the largest oil reserves in the world. Listen to the words of our national security advisor over here, John Bolton, talking about how it would be beneficial for American companies, oil companies, to be in Venezuela. So that's what they're doing. It has nothing to do about um, uh, anything else. It's not about democracy. How many times have you ever heard that BS line, we're bringing democracy and freedom to another country you know it has nothing to do with that at all it's again it's only about oil here's bolton's quote it's in the trends journal u.s has quote a lot at stake that's the quote given the fact that venezuela has the world's largest proven oil reserves and flatly stated quote we're in conversation with major american companies now it would make a difference if we could have American companies produce the oil in Venezuela, it would be good for the people of the United States. This is a criminal act right in front of everybody's eyes, and no one cares. Instead, they talk about, oh, like you said, you know, they're not letting that aid in. It's not aid. This is a way of overthrowing the government. And America has a long history of doing it, and look at the failures of bringing democracy to Iraq, to Syria, to Yemen. How about bringing democracy to Afghanistan? No, I got an idea. Let's bring it to Haiti. Hey, you've been to Nicaragua yet? They should have democracy too. Hey, let's throw overthrow that government of Honduras like Obama helped do back in 2009. They need better democracy. One country after another. And who do they bring in to bring democracy? A war criminal. They brought in a war criminal to help lead the charge of democracy, Elliot Abrams. That's right. Convicted war criminal during the Iran-Contra scandal and also a very big supporter of those Latin American death squads that slaughtered tens of thousands. And our Secretary of State, boasted, quote, Elliot will be a true asset to our mission to help the Venezuelan people restore democracy and prosperity to their country. Could you believe this? Could you right in front of everybody's eyes and no one cares? Why are the Democrats fighting so hard to keep the border open to illegal crossings? It's it's a um, mostly... We're looking at the 2020 elections coming up. You have a large number of Hispanic voters, and that's all they're interested in is the vote, the vote. Uh, as I say to anybody, if you want the board, I, I believe we should have a, um, a referendum. Very simple. It's the Salenti solution. Two, two questions. Yes, I want the wall. It will cost X billions of dollars. No, I don't want the wall. It will cost X dollars in taxpayer money for each immigrant coming into the country. That's all. Do you want to pay for it in paying for new people coming in or pay for let the people vote? I mean, rather than having the politicians decide. Again, they're doing it to Democrats because the elections are coming up and they need those Hispanic votes. It seems like they're trying to make the wall an election issue. What should be the big issue at at the next U.S. election? Well, you know, go back to the midterm elections in 2018. Not a peep from any of them on the Democratic and Republican side about war. 
about the uh, seven hundred and fifteen billion dollar now to be seven hundred and fifty billion dollar defense budget, not the slaughter of millions of people or trillions of dollars over the last twenty five years and so the, the the issues to me should be you know war and and rebuilding the nation, and none of that is really going to be an issue it's going to be an identity politics issue and also the socialism issue because people are doing so terrible and they want and and again the big issue is going to biggest issue that you're going to hear about is the inequality of wealth which is a real issue you're looking at you know it's worse now than it was during the gilded age in the distribution of wealth in the United States we have three people Buffett Bezos Bezos and 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 Gates have more money than half our population combined well, now, now maybe not Bezos. You got to split the dough with his uh, wife, or his ex-wife that he's getting divorced with. But in, in re- I mean, this has never been like this before. So the big issue in the election is going to be income inequality. Well, I guess you could still say the richest if you just say the Bezos. <laughs> yeah, there you go. <laughs> we'll have more with Gerald Salente when this week in money returns. Media recognition from Bloomberg, Reuters, recycling trade publications, patented process for 100% recovery of critical metals, including cobalt, lithium, nickel, manganese, aluminum. American Manganese is focused on recycling lithium-ion batteries for electric vehicles. American Manganese trades on the TSX Venture, AMY, the US, AMYZF, and Frankfurt 2AM. For more information, visit AmericanManganeseInc.com or phone me, Larry Ray, at 778-574-4444. I'm Douglas Mason, CEO of Naturally Splendid, symbol NSP on the TSX Venture Exchange. Naturally Splendid is a biotechnology and consumer products company focused on the global cannabis and health markets. Naturally Splendid is expanding distribution in this rapidly growing market with products currently in Canada, the USA, South Korea, Germany, and Australia. To view our comprehensive company presentation and for more information, please visit our website at naturallysplendid.com. This Week in Money is archived online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com. Welcome back to This Week in Money. We're speaking with Gerald Salente. Gerald, if President Trump is successful in replacing the head of the World Bank, could central banking be restructured to work for the people? No. Central banks are only interested in, uh, again, the 1%. Look what happened during the Great Recession. Too big to fail? making the banks bigger, taking our money after they created the problems? No, it'll be the same thing. It's just uh, whoever the central bank and world bank leaders are, it's just about uh, enriching the very rich. It's not They don't care about the average person. By their deeds, you shall know them. The tax cuts that the U.S. had, did it help the general population? Absolutely not, just as we had forecast when it happened. Look at the tax policy uh, uh, center's report when it happened. They said that the, and it's showing, that 82% of the wealth went to the 1%, and now we're seeing people returning their taxes in the early stages, and they're paying more for the average person. So all it did was enrich the rich in stock buybacks, over a trillion dollars worth in stock buybacks, and it drove up profits and, uh, and revenues. So that's all it's done. And again, we said this as well when it happened, because Again, tracking trends is an understanding of where we are, how we got here, and where we're going. You go back to when George Bush uh, Jr. did this back in uh, 2005, 2006, around that time. 95% of the tax breaks from bringing the money back from overseas went into stock buybacks. That's all it is. How is real estate doing around the world? It's a slowdown. I mean, you go take a trip to Southern California, one of the hottest markets, right? The home sales plunged 20% in December, the lowest pace since the Great Recession, 2008. Take a look what's going on over there in uh, Australia, Melbourne, Sydney. Yeah, they're down 9%, 12%. So, and then you're seeing new mortgage applications slumping. That's why we're saying there's not going to be a recession yet. They're going to dump more cheap money into the system from China to Japan, Europe, to North America. Name the place more cheap dough to keep the game going. 
Under communist rule and with an economy in decline, is China turning out to be a threat to the Western world? China will, you know, one of our sayings is the business of America's war, the business of China's business. It's a, uh, in, in, in the North America, in many countries, it's an outside-in economy, meaning that the pressure from the outside, the big corporations, pressure the politicians to do what they want them to do. In China, it's an inside-out. In other words, the Chinese government is the corporations, state-owned enterprises. They're running the show. And their major interest is not war. It's the economy. And there's 1.4 billion of them. Before they got into the World Trade Organization, you know, people talk about the tra- trade and tariff wars. You know, people forget back in the late 90s, there was a thing called the Battle in Seattle, well, hundreds of thousands of people took to the streets to protest the World Trade Organization. But the agents provocateurs had a bunch of these guys, you know, in great shape, smashing windows and burning cars, just a handful. And that did away with the whole movement because that's what they focused on. But there was a big push against the World Trade Organization in the United States because they knew what would happen. Before China got into the World Trade Organization, 5% of its population was middle class. Today, 35%. China has a bigger middle class than Canada and the United States as a population combined, and then add another 100 million on top of that one. So that's about what we're looking at. So they're not going anywhere. They all have their ups and downs, but again, when you look at their road, their road and belt initiative and what they're doing, what they're doing rather than invading countries, and signing up for more wars in different countries, they're in there buying up countries and building countries. So they may have a temporary downturn, but by the next 10 years, if not much sooner actually, China will have the world's largest gross domestic product. Should China and the U.S. make a trade deal? Of course they should. It's in China's best interest. Who would do business the way they'd... We're doing it. I mean, again, I mentioned about the, the Battle of Seattle back in the 90s. Uh, you know, they have, we have a 300 and what, 75 billion merchandise trade deficit with them, uh, last year. I mean, nobody would do business under those kind of terms. So, um, China's going to do business. You know, of course they will. So there'll be a trade deal. Do you see any trends forming for Canada? Canada is just going to follow uh, what the United States and Europe and, and Australia, other continents are doing. It's going to be a general slowdown. And the big issue with China, with uh, Canada, of course, is oil. Where oil price is going to go. So that's going to be really, it's going to determine a lot of the future of Canada, uh, because that's their, their, their major, uh, export item. And like, however, with, um, Venezuela, although Venezuela is sitting on the world's largest, uh, Reserves, oil reserves, you know, it's, it's, it's heavy, you know, it's, it's thick, and it needs to be, you know, diluted, and, and Canada has that same issue. But we're seeing now where oil prices are moving back up again. You're looking at Brent crude now back to near the 65 mark. And so, uh, if, if it stays in the range that it is, which again, we believe it will because we don't see an economic 9-11 coming right now, so the global economy will continue to grow. This year, it'll be more of the same for Canada. No big changes. We'll have more with Gerald Salente when This Week in Money returns. Grand Portage Resources recently completed the 2018 drill program on its 100% controlled Herbert Gold Discovery property located in the prolific Juneau Belt in southeast Alaska. Drill results are expected through late 2018. Past drill results included numerous multi-ounce gold assays on multiple veins. Grand Portage trading symbols are GPG on the TSX Venture, GPTRF on the OTCQB, and GPB on Frankfurt. For more information, please visit our website, Grand Grandportage.com. 
I'm Greg Johnston, CEO of Carl Data Solutions, an industrial Internet of Things company that provides big data solutions for monitoring critical infrastructure. Carl Data offers machine learning and predictive analytics features to our cloud-based applications to deliver key asset-saving operational insights from massive amounts of data. Carl Data trades on the CSE symbol CRL and the pink symbol CDTAF. For more details on Carl Data, please visit carlsolutions.com. This Week in Money is archived online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com. Welcome back. You're listening to This Week in Money. My guest, Gerald Salente. Gerald, President Trump says he wants to bring soldiers home. Is that good for America and the world? Yeah, but again, he's two-faced on this because, yes, it's great for the America and the world because we have no business being in other countries. We have, we have 800 bases overseas and about... 78 to 80 countries. We have no business being there. This is against the founding fathers of this nation. George Washington's farewell address, no foreign entanglements. And again, all the United States has is a history of failure in their foreign entanglements since World War II. Show me one victory. Who in anybody listening, who could, who could survive in their profession or business with having one failure after another? No one. And that's all the United States military has. Name the country, name the failure. So yes, it would be great to bring home all the troops, but now again, as what we're seeing, is they're instigating a, uh, a crisis with Venezuela. The United States is bombs away over there in Somalia. We're involved in Sudan. And like Canada, selling weapons that are killing innocent people in Yemen... So, you know, a lot of it's just talk rather than action. But again, if we had peace on earth, goodwill toward men and women, it would be a different place, wouldn't it? Is Trump doing a good job of exposing the far-left agenda of the Democrats? Well, again, you know, he's playing against the, quote, quote, socialist card because that's the one that's going to be played in the 2020 election. And again, it's not only... In the United States, look, look what's going on in France with the yellow vests. It's about income inequality. Look what's going on in Italy with the Five Star Movement and League. Look what's going on in Germany with the AFD Party, the Alternative for Deutschland. Look what's going on in Austria with the Freedom Party. It's the same thing. Most of it is about income inequality and not having, and the money going to the very rich. So, uh, that is one of the major issues. Of course, the other one in Europe particularly is the immigration issue, which they're not playing here in the States with the socialist movement. But he's preparing for 2020, and that's going to be the major issue. Income inequality, you're looking at the numbers. We talked about the tax breaks. I mean, for the average person, this meant nothing. You know, we still have to pay school tax. We have to pay real estate tax. We're, we're taxed to death. And so that's what's going to be the huge issue, the primary issue of the 2020 election, and he's facing off with it right now. He did it with his State of the Union address attacking the socialist movement. Is one of Trump's big challenges trying to convince people that government health care is not a good thing? Yes, and again, it goes back to the in- in- income inequality. You know, people, the health care costs are ridiculous in this country. And people, when the polls are showing that they want some kind of uh, a much better system. So it's going to be a campaign issue. But here's what we're saying, is that it's going to be, you know, the campaign slogan behind closed doors during the Clinton campaign in 1992 to keep the campaign focused on the one issue was, quote, it's the economy, stupid. And that's all it's going to be in 2020. It's the economy, stupid. And what we believe they're going to do, when we saw the pressure that already happened, is they're going to be lowering interest rates. Remember, we have a 2.25 to 2.50 overnight rate. they got a lot of room to go down. And as we also saw, whether it's in India, with throwing out the old central bank chair and putting a new one in, because Modi's running, uh, campaign is is looking at a new election coming up, the prime minister... He forced them to lower interest rates. You listen to what Trump said about raising interest rates in 2018. They're crazy. They're idiots. On and on and on. The pressure, the pressure, the pressure. 
And in spite of a very strong economy, in spite of very strong job numbers, in spite of the best year of income growth in the United States in 2018, the Fed chair backed out and they lowered rates. So the president has the power over Powell. We have the Powell put in place right now, and so we think they're going to be lowering rates between now and 2020 to keep the economy going. How is gold looking? Well, gold is where it is, and it's hanging in there. And again, as you well know, I've been saying this now for the better part of six years. Gold has to break over the $1,450 uh, an ounce mark to spike toward the 2000 and now it has to break above the 1385 mark to get to that direction and it hasn't been able to do that but it's looking solid over the 1300 and as they lower interest rates and make money cheaper gold will also maintain its safe haven asset as governments around the world lower interest rates and pump more monetary methadone into the bull to keep it running. Does silver seem to be in sync with gold? It's always been like that, you know, but silver's lagging, you know, ups and downs. But we think gold's going to be the leader and not silver. Does oil look like it's stuck in a trading range? Yes. We think the trading range is between 65 and probably about $72. That's our best estimate at this time. And again, it's also going to depend upon what goes on in the Middle East. There's a lot of talk about war against Iran. Matter of fact, they're even blaming Iran for the problems going on in Venezuela. The United States is that guy Pompeo, our Secretary of State, and others. And you're looking at the tensions building in the Middle East. If there's war breaks out and Iran's involved in it, and there's war in the Middle East, we're looking at $100 plus a barrel of oil. If that happens, kiss the global economy and the equity markets goodbye. Is this trust in mainstream and social media growing? Well, the distrust is more in in the mainstream media, and, the, and one of our top trends for 2019 is censorship 2019. And so it's the mainstream and the monopolies, the Twitters, the Googles, and the Facebooks that are prohibiting uh, a freedom of speech out there. So people want to go toward a new media with two, with new identities and options, but it's becoming harder and harder with the censorship from the monopolies to make that happen. Are there yellow vest protests in the U.S.? Because I don't see anything on American TV about it. No. The American people don't have the, the, the fight anymore in them to to uh, protest about much and if they do they go out one day and down in washington get on the bus go back home and you never hear from them again until the next year so no we don't see that happening here what's your latest global nomic view well the global nomic view again is ours is that we did a uh, a 180 on our economic 911 again showing that you can't predict the future there are too many wild cards so our our forecast now is that we're going to see moderate to slow economic growth in 2019, minus a wild card, of course. And then we're also going to look at um, uh, the prospects of war with Iran. And if that happens, you know, this will be the beginning of World War III, truly the war to end all wars, because it'll probably be the end of the world as well. What's the latest on occupation peace or occupy peace? Oh, the occupy peace. We're we're moving ahead. We're we're uh, looking to have a festival this coming September. We're trying to put that together. Of course, we need donations to make that happen. And uh, the website is occupypeace.com. Occupypeace.com. And again, if we don't occupy peace, the crazy people that keep taking us to war, they'll keep doing that because when all else fails. That's what they do. They take you to war. Well, if you need some money, I hear Bill and Melinda like to shovel it out the back door now and then. Yeah, but not for peace. There's Again, peace is a dirty word in in America, and not a mention of it in the midterm elections. And among all of the candidates in the presidential reality show in the Democratic Party, only one has come out against the United States' actions in uh, that they're taking against Venezuela. Most of them support it. 
and that's the woman from Hawaii, Gabbard. Is she a, a bright light for the Democrats and perhaps needs more publicity because people don't know a lot about her? Yeah, I believe she is. She's the only one that I would probably vote for at this time. And again, I didn't vote in the last election for any of them. I don't, I don't vote for lesser of two evils. I don't associate with lesser of two evils. I don't do business with lesser of two evils. So I would not uh, vote for any of the ones that are running right now. None of them appeal to me. I'll give you our forecast of who's going to, uh, we believe, be the Democratic nominee. And who would that be? Sent twenty nine ninety five. I'm only joking. The uh, it's going to be that guy uh, Beto O'Rourke. He's been taken under the wing. If he announces at the end of February, if he runs, he's taken under the wing of of uh, Oprah. And we wrote now a two thousand and eight Trends Journal when that happened back in two thousand and eight when Oprah took Obama under her wing. She is the queen of talk show radio, uh, talk show TV. I've been on Oprah twice and been on every other TV show as well. No, but no show came close to hers. She knows what to do. And you look how Obama, who was behind in the polls with Hillary Clinton at the time, when uh, she took him under her wing, he knew how to read that teleprompter, never, never strayed from the pitch, and he was going to give us hope and change you could believe in, and everybody bought it. And now Oprah has taken O'Rourke under her wing as well and hugging him and so if he announces that he's running plus by the way his uh daddy in law is a billionaire so he got the bucks behind him that who we believe is going to be the um the nominee at this time minus a wild card for the next election is jimmy kimmel right to call her queen oprah he certainly is Gerald, how can people find out more about Trends Journal? Trendsjournal.com, trendsjournal.com. It's the only magazine in the world that will give you history before it happens. It's the only trend magazine out there. If you want to prepare, prevail, and prosper in the future, we suggest you consider subscribing to the Trends Journal. And how much is that going to cost? It's only $10.75 a month, $129 a year. Gerald, thank you so much for being on This Week in Money. Thank you. My guest has been Gerald Salente, publisher of the Trends Journal. He was speaking to us from historic Kingston, New York. Coming up, Wolf Street publisher Wolf Richter next on This Week in Money. I'm Kelly Jennings, CEO of Powerband Solutions. Powerband is a cloud-based provider of auction, inventory, and finance solutions that make buying, selling, and financing vehicles more efficient. Powerband Solutions trades on the TSX Venture Exchange symbol PBX and on the OTCQB symbol PWWBF and on Frankfurt symbol 1ZV. For more information, please visit us at PowerbandSolutions.com. Cypress Development Corp.'s flagship lithium project is located just east of Alba Marley's Silver Peak Mine in the heart of Clayton Valley, Nevada. A 12-hole exploration drill program for lithium-enriched claystone on Cypress's 100% controlled properties is now underway. Cypress Development Corp. trades on the TSX Venture Exchange symbol CYP, the pink CYDVF, and on Frankfurt C1Z1. For more information, please visit our website, cypressdevelopmentcorp.com. This Week in Money is archived online at talkdigitalnetwork.com. Welcome back to This Week in Money. We're speaking with Wolf Richter, publisher of wolfstreet.com. He's speaking to us from San Francisco. Welcome back to the show, Wolf. Thanks for having me, Jim. Wolf, given the strong labor market in the U.S., auto loan delinquencies should be really low. Is that the case? Yeah, so... Uh, this is baffling a little bit, the industry. Of course, we've seen this for a while. Auto loans, uh, auto loan delinquencies, uh, have surged to the worst level since the Great Recession and actually, uh, since the, since close to the peak of the, uh, default rates that we've seen in the first quarter of 2011. 
So now auto loans are, there's four and a half percent of the auto loans outstanding are over 90 days delinquent, which is a huge amount. That's over seven million Americans. Uh, that's more than ever before. And, uh, uh, yeah, the, the, the thing is last time we had this kind of search in, in auto loan delinquencies, we had a housing crisis and we had, uh, mounting job losses and millions of people were out of work. And Lehman had collapsed. And, you know, all kinds of heck had broken loose before we got to this level. This time around, unemployment is, has been between 3.7% and 4% over the last 12 months. Uh, even if these numbers don't actually mean what they say, you know, I look at this, this labor market, and it's the strongest labor market since 1999 from what I can tell. I mean, there are pockets of weakness and... Uh, you know, there's still a lot of people out of work and a lot of people that are, uh, that stop looking for work because they're discouraged and, you know, so you have these issues in the labor market, but, but it is, and it, you know, it's the labor market in the United States has been weak for a very, very long time, but this is the strongest, it's like the cleanest dirty shirt I've seen in 20 years. And, uh, and so I wouldn't, I wouldn't expect, um, auto loans uh, to become delinquent like this, but this is exactly what happened, and it started in uh, in early 2016, and and when the rate seriously ticked up, and 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 in fact, after the financial crisis, they never regressed back down to the to the classic levels of delinquencies being between two and three percent. Uh, you know, they never went that far down. So they they went down quite a bit, and then they started picking up again. And in 2016, they were riding higher, and now we've reached this. This, this very worrisome level of four and a half percent of all outstanding balances, and uh, now we can explain this in different ways. One is that there are a lot of people who uh, who are struggling with their jobs. You know, the labor market overall, on average, you know, is is, is as good as it's been. But you know, beneath the covers, there are a lot of issues. There's a lot of uh, uh, gig work going on. You know, and there's some other issues. Uh, the other thing is that uh, vehicles have be- become a lot more expensive, and uh, so they're they're more expensive to finance. And uh, in 2015, 2000, well, sorry, in 2014, a lot of uh, companies, smaller companies, uh, started uh, doing subprime lending, specialized subprime lending. Many of them were backed by uh, private equity firms. And so they started very aggressively going after uh, uh, customers, after consumers with tarnished credit ratings, and uh, that that couldn't finance a vehicle at a at a regular bank. And so these <clears throat> these companies have picked up the riskiest company, uh, customers and have financed them in very expensive vehicles and stretched out the loan terms for as long as possible to get the payments down. And at the same time, they're charging, you know, extraordinary interest rates, uh, to these subprime customers, you know, 10%, 15%. So if you're making a car payment on a, with a 10% interest, you know, it's going to be very, very high. And, and these are the people that can least afford to pay high interest rates. And, uh, yeah, that industry has gotten hit pretty hard. In 2018, uh, several of these, uh, specialized lenders already collapsed. Uh, much of the, uh, the risk that is spread, yeah, they, uh, they don't, uh, hang on to these subprime loans. They securitize them and sell them as auto loan backed, uh, ABS asset backed securities and they go into pension funds and they go overseas and they go all over the place. So, uh, yeah, the risk, uh, has been spread and so are the losses. Nevertheless, they do retain uh, some loss and some risk, and, and, and so they're, they're getting in trouble. They're also borrowing from banks, and some of those loans have gotten in trouble when the specialized auto lenders collapsed. So there's a whole industry that sprung up uh, to service these subprime customers, and, and that is now haunting us. And, you know, the, the problem isn't uh, the prime borrowers. They're in really good shape in the United States. The problem is the, the auto loans. Uh, that went to subprime customers, that's about 23% of the outstanding balance, and a share of that 23% is is now in trouble. Uh, in dollar terms, you know, it, it's about $280 billion that is lent out to in, in, in these auto loans to subprime customers. 
So it's not going to take down the financial system per se. It's not really big enough. Uh, but it's going to take down some of the smaller specialized London already has, and you know, there's already a, a gaggle of them that that have collapsed. Um, so it, it comes down to to just this whole idea of uh, specialized lenders trying to make uh, as much money as possible. Uh, and subprime lending is incredibly profitable for a while. You know, because you can charge these high interest rates, you can charge ten or fifteen percent on a loan, and these customers. Will say yes because they've been to the banks and they, uh, you know, they've asked for credit for a loan and, and to get these cars financed and they were turned down. So now they're they're being shopped uh, to uh, specialized auto finance lenders and they say yes, but it's an interest of twelve percent and there are these conditions and and so the deal gets made with uh, a very small chance of ever uh, working out long term. Now, these specialized auto finance lenders that, that do this, uh, that, you know, do the subprime lending, uh, half of the loans are the subprime rated customers. And then with some of these lenders, almost all of the loans are the subprime rated customers. And that's where the, the problems are. They're a relatively small, uh, component in the U.S. lending industry. The, you know, the big banks, or six big banks in the United States, uh, over half a trillion dollars in assets and, and the credit union between the two, uh, they, they finance about two thirds of all auto loans and they're in pretty good shape and the captive auto lenders are Fort Motor Credit and Kia Motors Credit and, and, and these, uh, captive companies, they're, they're, they're pretty careful too in the underwriting and so they're, they're not going to get in trouble. It's the specialized Auto finance companies that, that are are behind much of this, and they are seeing the most damage of that. Now, the auto industry per se uh, is looking at this another way. You know, they they uh, had a record sales year in 2016, and for uh, combined, you know, for U.S. automakers and Toyota and some other bigger automakers, the, the record year was 2015, and sales have since been declining. But 2017 and 2018 were down years. And part of the reason why they're down years for these automakers is because the subprime customer is now getting cut off on credit. Because these loans are delinquent to such an extent that the lenders are getting careful and the, the auto lenders that are not getting careful, they're collapsing now. You know? So um, it, it is turning the faucet off to, to, uh, to these high-risk customers and, and the Automakers are feeling that, and and that's why they cannot uh, sell as many cars as they used to because of that that yeah that that layer of buyers has disappeared. These uh, sometimes customers are still buying cars. I mean, you've got to have a car in uh, most parts of the United States just to to go to the grocery store and do whatever you want to do. But uh, they're not buying new cars anymore. They're buying some cheap used car. And, uh, maybe they're borrowing money from, uh, mom and dad or whatever to get that done. Because now they'll walk out of, uh, 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 of the new car market with, if they have a subprime, uh, credit rating. And this is a, uh, so I'm not worried about the big banks. Uh, like we had an issue during the financial crisis. I don't think this is the issue here. And I'm not worried about the credit union. And I'm not worried about the captive, uh, auto lenders. Uh, you know, I'm, I would, I'm worried about the specialized lenders, and they're really not a big issue to the financial system. Banks have some exposure to them via loans, but not a huge amount. Most of the losses are spread around to investors via the securitizations. What I'm worried about is the inability of the subprime rated customers to buy a new vehicle. And that is happening now, and this is going to dog the auto industry going forward and has already started showing up. So the auto industry is starting to lose that layer of customers because they're being cut off from credit. And uh, as this uh, delinquency rate goes up, uh, lenders are going to tighten their underwriting more and more. And uh, so we will we will continue to see pressure on these uh, customers uh, uh, in a way where they can no longer buy new vehicles. You know, they'll they'll be pushed into the used car market and they'll be pushed into the lower end of the used car market. Uh, and will disappear from the new vehicle market. So I, I think this is a one of the major headwinds we're seeing for the auto industry.
going forward. Were eight and nine year car loans a recipe for disaster as well? Because you're paying on a car that isn't worth what you're paying for it. You know, when you pass seven years. Yeah, I mean that's an issue, uh, and it's not necessarily related to the, the number of defaults. Even though if you default on a uh, eight year car loan and you're two years into the loan. The loss for the lender is much higher than if you default on a four-year car loan two years into the loan. So, I mean, the the, the losses will be higher. Uh, it doesn't necessarily trigger uh, more more def- uh, defaults, but uh, you know the 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 drawback of these long-term loans is that you're locking people into the vehicle for a very long time, and they're not going to be able to trade. And uh, so that is another headwind that the auto industry, the new vehicle industry, is, is finding. And, and and already these people are upside down when they trade, and they trade uh, with an upside down balance into a new vehicle that has a an eight year loan. You know they're going to be stuck for many years uh, in that vehicle without being able to sell it. You know because it it uh, the loan value is so much higher than the than the 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 price that they could get for the vehicle. So this is definitely a headwind. And, you know, it's borrowing from the future. So when when uh, uh, finance companies started doing this, um, you know, they're, in a sense, in essence, the auto industry was borrowing future sales and bringing them forward. And uh, this is going to, it's going to hurt them. We'll have more with Wolf Richter when This Week in Money returns. Hi, I'm Douglas Mason, President and CEO of Magnum Gold Corp, MGI and the TSX Venture Exchange. A 2015 drill program on the LH property intersected several high-grade gold intersections, including 11 meters of 20.66 grams per ton gold. Additional drill targets on the LH property have been identified by a 2018 drone airborne magnetic survey to further evaluate a pyrotite enriched gold bearing system. Please visit our website at magnumgoldcorp.com. This Week in Money is archived online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com. Welcome back. We're speaking with Wolf Richter. Wolf, how will battery electric vehicles impact the global auto industry? With uh, battery electric vehicles, the thing to remember is is one thing. There there are uh, two major uh, components to that car. Uh, One is the battery and the other component is everything else. And the battery is very expensive and is very complex in a, in a sense, chemically complex and very difficult to make. And it consists of many battery cells, uh, that are made by, by battery cell makers such as Panasonic. And then the automaker puts these battery cells into a battery pack and installs them and, and designs, uh, software and, and, and other technology around it to control it. And and that's the hard part. The battery cells are very expensive. Uh, still, the prices are coming down, uh, but they're still very expensive. Now, the electric vehicle itself, aside from the battery, is incredibly simple. You're replacing the very complex internal combustion engine, uh, the transmission, the exhaust system, the cooling system, the oil system, you know, the oil pump, the whole thing, the emission control system, the air filtration system. <laughs> I mean, all these components, uh, the drive shaft, the trans, I mean, every little thing that, that the whole powertrain has, you're replacing it with a basic electric motor. And these electric motors are essentially maintenance-free. They run for a very long time. Uh, they are perfectly suited for driving. They have essentially a flat torque curve. So you get the instant acceleration. Electric powered vehicles, you know, they they have no problem at all outperforming sports cars with internal combustion engines. And uh, a, a number of these electric vehicles, instead of an engine uh, under the hood, they have a storage compartment under the hood <laughs> in the front, and they you know have a regular trunk in the back. And so it's just really uh, really simple to make except for the battery. Now, for automakers, the problem is this. Automakers, 
don't control the battery cell technology. That is done by companies like Panasonic or uh, Chinese companies. A number, so Panasonic is the largest battery cell maker in the world. Uh, a Chinese company called uh, CATL is the second largest. Uh, you know, there's a couple of Korean companies, a more Chinese company. Uh, there are really no American companies in that field that make battery cells. And that's the technology that is core to an electric vehicle, and the automakers don't control it. They have to buy it. And the uh, uh, technology that goes into the rest of the vehicle, that can be handled by component makers. So uh, the electric motors are made by uh, companies that make electric motors, such as Bosch and others. Uh, the suspension systems are already made by component makers. Door assemblies are made by component makers. You, car makers today can buy a fully assembled uh, power leather seat uh, from a component maker and just install it. So this is why it is possible for automakers today, uh, with no prior experience, uh, to put together an electric vehicle because they can get all the components in the market and a lot of these component makers will help you design those components so they'll fit your, your specs. And uh, an example of that, and I use that because it's a funny example, is the German Postal Service. Uh, they wanted to get an electric delivery vehicle uh, and they asked Volkswagen, the second or second largest or largest automaker in the world, depending how you look at it, they asked them to uh, to bid on it, and they asked other German automakers to bid on it, and they refused uh, back in 2014. They, the German automakers were into diesel. They poo-pooed the electric vehicle, and they refused to bid on it. So the Postal Service bought a little bit of startup, and they decided to uh, create their own electric delivery vehicle. And, you know, they're getting their parts from around the world, and, and they're just putting this thing together. They're now producing over 5,000. Uh, they're putting over 5,000 of these vehicles in service that have expanded production capacity to or they can produce over 20,000 to start a year. They're starting to put, uh, to sell them to third parties. Now, if the German Postal Service can do that, anybody can do that. Yeah. <laughs> That's the thing, you know. You have component makers that can make all of the components and you just, and help you design them and you just have to put them together. And the battery cell technology is the most difficult, most expensive part and that is not controlled by the automakers. And this, uh, when you think about this, uh, this will lead to a commodification of the auto industry. Now, so now you have the battery cell makers on one hand side and the component makers on the other, and you have companies in the middle that put it all together and assemble the vehicle and market it and, uh, and, and build the distribution channels for those vehicles and do the warning work and those kinds of things. And uh, the vehicles will essentially be the same under the skin. They will have different paint jobs and uh, slightly different uh, looks, but the components will be made by the same people in different parts of the world. The battery cells and the battery will be the most important thing because it, that gives you the range and it gives you the cost and it gives you uh, the time it takes to charge up the vehicle and how long it can hold a charge and those kinds of things. And you know, automakers don't control that. Any automaker can buy the same battery from, from the battery makers. So going forward, you will have an enormous battle uh, between new entrants that can come in very successfully, like Tesla and, and many others. There are dozens of electric vehicle makers in China that are, are pressuring uh, the legacy automakers. And uh, they're just they're sprouting like mushrooms. And, uh, you know, the Deutsche Post, the German Postal Service with its delivery vehicle is starting to sell these uh, vehicles to third parties. They're pressuring the utility vehicle industry in Germany you know, and, and, and in the Eurozone in general where they're selling. And so you have these new entrants that came from nowhere. They're using the components from component makers. They're sending these vehicles, and, and suddenly uh, it, it leads to a commodification of the industry where, where it's very difficult to distinguish one from the other and uh, and probably it will exert, as you go down this route, major margin pressures on the legacy automakers that are still trying to, uh, you know, to distinguish their vehicle and get extra bucks for for the brand. And I, I see that disappearing over the, the years. And it will, we're not... Uh, this is not happening overnight, you know. This is a, a fairly slow process. 
and the legacy automakers are now catching on to it, and every major, every global automaker now has electric vehicles in the lineup. And they're seeing that too. They're doing the math, and they realize that if they can get the battery price down, they can produce EVs for a lot less than they can an internal combustion engine vehicle because it's just a lot simpler to build, and there's hardly any maintenance. The warranty work will largely disappear. Uh, you know, there's a lot of benefits uh, to doing this. And, you know, as we go forward over the next, uh, you know, five, ten years, uh, this will become a industry, uh, in which, uh, you know, commodity type vehicles, uh, at a relatively low price, uh, from unknown automakers, uh, will start make, uh, will start making major inroads. And, uh, and the legacy automakers will be in for the, for the fight of the life, you know, to, to deal with that pressure. You know, Tesla, as much as we criticize it, is already uh, putting the screws to BMW and Mercedes in, in the United States. Uh, that's who Tesla competes with and in terms of price, and and they've, they've taken share uh, from these legacy automakers. Now BMW and Mercedes are fighting back. They're going to bring, relatedly, their own electric vehicles on the market, um, and this is happening in an environment where it's very difficult to even sell a car in the United States. I mean, everything is pickups, SUVs, crossovers, and vans, and that's that's what's selling. And in terms of cars, car sales are down like 35% from 2014, even as truck sales have, have surged. So in that environment, uh, Tesla is eating the lunch of BMW and, and Mercedes, and they're not they're now forced to fight back. And that's a you know that that, that was a no name startup a few years ago. And, uh, and this war, and in China, this is happening left and right. There's dozens of them. Uh, so I, I think this will, this will be a generational shift in the auto industry that we're looking at here. And, uh, this commodification of vehicles that we're, we're seeing where the battery, the core component is not under control of the automakers. Where somebody else controls that technology and the, that's the single most important technology and everybody else just does the simple stuff. And, uh, uh, you know, so I think we will be in for, for quite a bit of turmoil in the auto industry. We'll have more with Wolf Richter when This Week in Money returns. MGX Minerals is revolutionizing the new energy economy with patented lithium extraction technology, replacing traditional solar evaporation using low-cost, low-energy nanofiltration. The first system of this paradigm shift technology is currently being commissioned. MGX Minerals trades on the CSE, symbol XMG, the OTCQB, symbol MGXMF, and Frankfurt, symbol 1MG. For more information, visit our website, mgxminerals.com. Don't miss out. Stay informed. Receive the HowStreet.com weekly recap with thought-provoking podcasts, radio, and articles delivered to your inbox. Sign up for the HowStreet.com weekly recap on our homepage at HowStreet.com. This Week in Money is archived online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com. Welcome back to This Week in Money. We're speaking with Wolf Richter. Wolf, how is the New York City housing market doing? Yeah, so this is uh, something that's a little further away from me. I live in San Francisco, and I watch the West Coast housing market pretty closely. But uh, there's an interesting thing that uh, uh, that Street Easy did. Street Easy is uh, is one of the major listing sites, and it's uh, in New York City. It only covers New York City. Uh, it doesn't cover the rest of the nation, but it's very big in New York City. And what it did. Uh, it looked at all the listings uh, that were put on its site in the spring of uh, 2018. So in uh, in March, April, and May, and there's 12,000 homes were listed on Street Easy in New York City uh, during those three months. And that was a that was a a big wave of listings. That's a lot of of listings back then. And and then Street Easy went back just a few days ago and checked. Uh, these listings against uh, public records to see how many of them actually sold, and they found that only 52 percent, only 48 percent of them sold. 52 percent have not yet sold as of early February. So, of the 12,000 units that were listed in in the spring in New York City uh, in 2018, 
52% have not sold. And uh, in some areas of New York City, it was worse. In Manhattan, 56% have not sold. And it's worse by price as you go up. So in the uh, unit below $1 million, 45% failed to sell. And the homes listed above $1 million. And a $1 million is not that much in New York City. Uh, so $1 million is over 61% failed to sell. And in the homes that listed at $5 million and over uh, 79% failed to sell. So, and there were, you know, was close to 700 units in that 5 million plus category. That's quite a bit uh, that were listed in that, that short time frame. And uh, there's almost 80% failed to sell. And uh, that comes to kind of a shocker. You, know, but you can't really see that. What people do is, a seller will do is that they'll put the unit on the market and it doesn't sell on that, pull it off. And it disappears as a listed unit. And it looks like they're, you know, there's less inventory than what there really is. And that, that home is essentially still for sale, but it's in the shadow inventory. Now it has disappeared. Uh, but it's still there waiting, uh, for the, for the opportunity to be sold. And these unsold units from last spring, most of them will reappear, uh, on the market this spring. Uh, in addition to all the units that uh, that sellers want to sell uh, that didn't try to sell them last spring, so this shows a market uh, that is a, that has a serious problem. In in Manhattan, home prices are uh, have been declining on a year over year basis for the past six months. They're they're now down uh, compared to a year ago by by something like forty thousand dollars median price. Um, in other boroughs, it's it's uh, it's flattening out. Uh, but the the real problem that we're seeing in, in in home sellers not being able to sell the homes. They put them on the market and there's no buyers there. And there are no buyers because the sellers want a price that is now, uh, you yeah, know, that doesn't exist anymore except in their imagination. And the buyers are there, but they're not at that price point. You know, they're, they're quite a bit lower. So if you price your home aggressively, you go down in price, and uh, you undercut some of the listings, and uh, and it's a good home. You know you'll sell it very quickly, but you have to cut the price. And that's the uh, that's the thing that sellers haven't really figured out yet. Uh, that in order to sell in this market, in order to get rid of that home, you know you have to find the buyers, and the buyers are quite a bit lower than they were a year ago or two years ago. So you know there's liquidity, but it's not at that price point. At the price point where most of the sellers are, there's no liquidity. There's nobody buying. There's nobody interested. They're not even showing up. And uh, this is a clear sign that uh, the New York City housing market uh, is is has turned. And we, we have seen similar things in other housing markets here on the West Coast. But this is the first time I've actually seen somebody do a study on this to see uh, you know which of the homes that listed actually sold. Over the over the next twelve months, and uh, to see that fifty two percent of the homes that were listed in the spring actually never sold. I mean that's a uh, uh, that's a worrisome statistic, and you know fifty six percent in Manhattan didn't sell, and eighty percent of the homes over five million didn't sell, and and you know and it, it's not that there are no buyers; it's that there are no buyers at these price points. And the sellers will have to come down. And when the sellers are coming down, you know, the, to make deals and deals are being made, uh, that's when the official home prices, uh, as they're recorded, uh, will, will show the drops, you know, they'll show the median price drops or the cash shiller price drops, uh, that we're now starting to see in some markets. So, uh, you know, this, this lack of liquidity at current prices, um, it's, it's kind of an astonishing thing to see buyers just, just refuse to even be interested. You know, they just don't even go there. And uh, and they're willing and they're able and they're eager to buy, but not at those prices. Wolf, thank you so much for being on This Week in Money. Thank you, Jim. My guest has been Wolf Richter, publisher of WolfStreet.com. He was speaking to us from San Francisco. And that wraps up the show for this week. We'd like to thank our guests. Ross Clark, Gerald Salente, Wolf Richter, and thank you for listening. If you have any questions for the show, you can send them to info at howstreet.com. Now stand by for company showcase updates 
from American Manganese CEO Larry Ray, Abin Resources President Jim Pettit, and Naturally Splendid President Craig Goodwin. I'm Jim Goddard. We'll be back next week with more This Week in Money. Comments made on This Week in Money are an expression of opinion only and should not be construed in any manner whatsoever as recommendations to buy or sell any financial instrument at any time. Archived online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com. This Week in Money is a production of Howe Street Media Incorporated. Executive producer is Tom Allen. Welcome to Company Showcase, an advertising feature on HowStreet.com. I'm Jim Goddard. I'm speaking with American Manganese CEO and President Larry Ray. Larry, welcome back to the show. Hey, Jim. This is a good time to be talking to me. Larry, it sounds like you've got some cheerful news. Yeah, we've announced uh, this morning that our Stage 1 and Stage 2 of our uh, pilot plant was a successful start. And uh, one thing that before I, I leave that subject about the start was that the real unknown in the pilot plant for us was that we'd only done a certain amount of uh, test work on the preparation of the cathode material. And uh, so that was, uh, you know, even even though we had a pretty smooth startup, we did have to change a few things mechanically. But it was successful. And, uh, you know, then talking to Cometco, they feel that there's no problem with the balance. We've done a lot of work on the uh, the chemical solution, the hydrometallurgical solution, and uh, is all we know is that uh, it works. Uh, we get 100% of it back, and we should have no problem in that area, maybe with a little bit with uh, valve sizes or something like that, but nothing serious. So that's uh, that's exciting. I mean, getting that behind us, is a big plus for the company and the shareholders. It's, uh, I can't, you know, I can't, I can't say enough about it because I'm very excited about it. And, uh, you know, we've demonstrated on a pilot scale that the uh, stage one and stage two work. And, uh, it provides evidence that the company's lithium ion battery recycling technology is economically sound. Now, just as an aside, people are wondering, what is the cost of this material? The only thing that we can really address that uh, that uh, would give you a ballpark area is that uh, the cathode uh, uh, costs of a metallurgical process, like I'm talking about reagents and everything, is about a dollar per kilogram. And uh, the value of the material we're working with is sixteen twenty-five a kilogram. So that leaves a lot of room for other things to happen and uh, still keep this thing in a robust condition. So that is, uh, that's what we can definitely hang our hat on. And we actually think that we can actually reduce that dollar a kilogram down further. And, uh, and we'll be working on that. And that may involve another... Uh, Another uh, filing for a uh, a uh, patent with the U.S. But that said and done, this is all dovetailing with some important meetings that we've been having. Now the pilot plant is up. At the end of the day, we should have samples that can be sent to battery companies, and they should take note of that. So they can test our material to see how it works on their battery. And the other thing that uh, people don't realize is that when we talk about cobalt prices, we're not talking about the battery grade. The battery grade is 65% higher. And what we produce in high purity is a, uh, a battery grade material. And that's for all of the, uh, chemi- uh, the metals in the uh, battery. It's a premium price. So uh, we haven't said much about that because we've got negotiations in front of us, but the fact of the matter is 
that uh, we're looking at, uh, you know, at least, uh, say, 30 40% better prices than uh, you can get anywhere else. And if we can do a, uh, say, uh, Tesla's uh, batteries and uh, turn them around to them at battery grade, that's a huge savings. And uh, they can just put that right into a new battery and away they go. Now, that sounds like a big... Uh, Big proposition, but I'm working with the right people to do that with the Kometco guys. So, what do we look at after this? Well, we look at the commercial plant. People are wondering what we're going to do about that. Well, our thinking is that we have, you know, some bits of interest on uh, perhaps a convertible debenture or a bond issue, and uh, we would like to do most of that because we see that paying back within the probably within a year and a half. And uh, so that's that's the uh, direction we're going. We're talking about $10 million. That's not totally solid. Uh, that's just a, uh, a guesstimate at this time. It could be uh, less. It could be a little more. And it could not be, it may not be three tons. It could be five or six tons. And... Uh, you know, which would double the uh, capacity of the machine pay back faster. So, uh, yeah, this is a great day for us, and uh, this is a, you know, a day that the market should recognize that we're a player. And, uh, you know, it wasn't for the predatory trading out there. I think we'd have been a 30, 40 cent stock here months ago. And, uh, but we will get there. And uh, because, uh, you know, now we have what I feel the world needs, and uh, eventually they're going to have to sit down and, uh, you know, talk about this with us. So uh, that's uh, that's buried in behind that press release is uh, all the opportunities that are suddenly open to us. And uh, and I just like to remind people that I was involved in a, uh, a company that had a uh, that was doing molybdenum. Nobody even knew how to pronounce it at the time. And uh, we've traded at a you know three to ten million dollar market cap for two and a half to three years, and uh, didn't break out until more people started talking about you know mining or exploration for molybdenum, and uh, got to be uh, we were one, and then one of six, and then one of twenty, and then one of hundreds. And uh, at that time, this company broke out and had a three hundred million dollar market cap which uh, uh, that was the Adenac project. And uh, not only that, but the money was there. $80 million came in for a bridge loan. $640 million was piled up behind it to uh, a bond issue, and it was spoken for. But anyway, it's a, I won't go into the uh, craziness of boards of directors, uh, but they killed the company. And uh, but that's in this case... You know, we're talking about a very small startup. When you're talking $10 million, that's usually just a drill program to find the reserves. The reserves are right there. We can now calculate the reserves of every battery that comes through the door and how much material is in that. And uh, we don't have to drill a hole. We don't have to mobilize out to a remote site. It's right there. And, uh, of course, once, uh, you know, the... Uh, the process that our uh, MOU partners have is uh, in the Netherlands is you know takes it uh, we've got about a 90, 90 to ninety four or some percent recovery on the material they supply us by uh, shredding. So uh, once it's uh, shredded, it's no longer a hazardous material and that can go across borders much easier. So hey. It's a great day, Jim. Larry, you told me in the past one of the reluctance uh, for some people to get into the electric car business was the unknowns surrounding the recycling of their batteries. Has this removed the unknown? We can remove the unknown. They're all talking about recycling now. And, uh, you know, as far as we're concerned, we have the most advanced process. Uh, but the key thing is that we have the process that works in a circular economy, we nothing going back into the environment, everything being used up, 
and uh, we eventually will get the whole squeal, squeal from the pig. Larry, how can people find out more about American manganese, and where are you trading? Well, we're traded on the Toronto Stock Exchange Venture under the symbol AMY. We're traded in the uh, U.S. under the symbol AMYZF. And we're traded in the uh, Frankfurt Exchange under the symbol 2AM. You can go and find out all the material that I'm talking about at our website, AmericanManganeseInc.com. And you can uh, reach me at... 778-574-4444 or email me at l-r-e-a-u-g-h at a-m-y-n-n dot com Larry, thank you so much for the update. You're welcome. I've been speaking with Larry Ray, CEO and President of American Manganese. I'm Jim Goddard. Our conversation took place on February 15th. Comments made on Company Showcase are an expression of opinion only and should not be construed in any manner whatsoever as recommendations to buy or sell any financial instrument at any time. Archived online at HowStreet.com. Company Showcase is a production of How Street Media Incorporated. Welcome to Company Showcase, an advertising feature on HowStreet.com. I'm Jim Goddard. I'm speaking with Jim Pettit, CEO and President of Abin Resources. Welcome back to the show, Jim. Thank you very much, Jim. So what's going on in BC's Golden Triangle right now? Um, probably a lot of snow. <laughs> There's not much else going on up there. Uh, you know, we pulled out of there back in November, uh, right at the beginning. Um, no, I think it's pretty much wrapped up. But uh, right now, it's just data compilation time. Working out plans for next year, or for this year now, um, this summer coming up, uh, you know, mobilizing, trying to get everything organized and mobilized, uh, ready to be mobilized anyway. Um, you know, that's all in place. We've got, uh, the camp is secured, um, for the next, for this coming year. And, uh, the guys are working on a strategy and a plan, uh, where to start drilling how much area to cover, and they're gradually working up a, a sense of how many meters we're going to be looking at drilling and uh, and where. The boundary zone is definitely not finished yet. Uh, we've got a lot of targets there that we've you know we want to get to, so there, there'll be a lot more going on. And we've got the access to more pads, so our location uh, choice is going to be vastly different than last summer. Um, and we may even do some more work up in the uh, up at the in the Yukon on the Justin, which will allow us to get in in April and do a good thirty to forty five days up there, and then do uh, what we're going to do in the, for the whole summer on the flagship at uh, Forest Kerr. So beyond that, so this is when you do all of your planning and strategy stuff. Yeah, yeah. This time of year is perfect to do it. Um, you know, and then we've also you know we've just gone through a series of. Shows that start right after the new year. Um, I was at all three of them. Well, actually four now. Um, and, you know, it's a good way to meet uh, the shareholders and, and bring them up to speed. I mean, the first one was the Metals Investor Forum, which I was invited to and presented at, and that was really busy. A very good show. Uh, you know, it's not an overly huge one, but there's a select number of companies invited, and then everyone presents them. And all the investors are there, and it's put on by the newsletter writers, a group of them. And uh, that was busy, and then, I mean, that was like a Friday and Saturday, and then the Sunday, Monday was the Cambridge show, the VRIC, which was extremely busy. All the years I've been going to uh, Cambridge, even when Joe Martin still ran it, now his son's doing it. That was one of the busiest shows I've I've been to. Um, there was a lot of people there. And, you know, that made for very busy times, and and lots of updating. Uh, you know, there's a lot of investors that show up there that they're already invested. I had, I had Abin as well as Cyprus and Sky Harbor there. We we split two booths, and uh, it made for some very crowded times. It's good. It's very good. It's very upbeat. Um, you know, the tenor of the whole show was very positive. Um, and then, you know, generally people think gold is going to lead the way into a new market upswing. So. You know, I think we might be at the bottom, but we're just coming out. What were the most common questions uh, your shareholders asked? 
Well, they want to know, you know, what we're what we're doing with all the information we gleaned from this last season, last summer, um, and into the fall, and what we're what we're going to do with that as going forward. Uh, a lot of them want to know if we're raising money because they all want to be part of a financing. Um, the good news is <laughs> for for us is we we don't need to raise any money. Uh, we raised it all last year on, based off of some really good news. Our, you know, we started last year's season with some very strong results, like 38 grams over 10 meters, and within that was 62 grams of in, within six meters. So, you know, that's pretty strong stuff. And we raised um, during the season, you know, another seven million on top of the one and a half we raised before we started drilling. So, you know, that's a lot of. A lot of money, and we've still got oh, just under six million to go, you know, through this year. So we don't really need to raise money. Jim, where are you traded, and where can people get more information about Abin? Well, we're traded on the TSX Venture Exchange under the symbol ABN, um, and under the uh, in the U.S. OTC QB under ABN AF. And they can reach us. Uh, you can go to the website and get a phone number. Uh, you can contact me and Don Myers quite easily. Jim, thanks a lot for the update. You bet. Thanks. We've been speaking with Jim Pettit, CEO and President of Abin Resources. I'm Jim Goddard. Our conversation took place on February 12th. Comments made on Company Showcase are an expression of opinion only and should not be construed in any manner whatsoever as recommendations to buy or sell any financial instrument at any time. Archived online at HowStreet.com. Company Showcase is a production of How Street Media Incorporated. Welcome to Company Showcase, an advertising feature on HowStreet.com. I'm Jim Goddard. I'm speaking with the president of Naturally Splendid, Craig Goodwin. Welcome back to the show, Craig. Thank you very much, Jim. Great to be here again. Craig, Naturally Splendid had some exciting news yesterday. Can you tell us about it? Absolutely. Uh, Very big news for Naturally Splendid. Uh, We announced that we have closed off a private placement in the way of an equipment purchase with Wahoopta. Um, in this transaction, we secured multiple small batch cannabinoid extraction units, and this begins to put into play our vertically integrated strategy. So, very big day for us yesterday, Jim. You mentioned a small batch extraction strategy. Why is that important? You know, we've looked at a number of strategies uh, over the past year. And I know that tendency in the industry right now is is large capacity units, and there's certainly room for that strategy as well. Um, We're of the mind after being in the hemp business for the past decade and watching the technology and the processes evolve in just plain old oil and hemp processing, protein processing, there's an evolution of these processes. Uh, The truth is, the fact is, that Canada has not farmed for CBD in the past um, in in the way of hemp, and that this is a learning process. The extraction sciences and the extraction technologies are proved out. What we don't know yet is how to prepare the material for extraction. By doing small batches, Jim, this allows us the greatest flexibility to help the farmers reap the biggest yield out of their, their biomasses. It also produces um, optimum optimum opportunities for us to create varied products simultaneously. The advantage with a large processing unit is you can produce large large amounts of biomass all at once. But if that one unit is being repaired or is down for cleaning, effectively 100% of your production is shut off. By using multiple smaller batch units, you're able to keep producing 100% of the time. What have you done in preparation for the acceptance of cannabis-infused food products in Canada? Well, we continue to build out our existing clientele, and we do this in two areas. Naturally Splendid has a number of company-branded products under the brands Natera Hemp Foods, Natera Sport, uh, Natera FX, and these are all clients of ours who are used to hemp-based products. 
And we're beginning to build consumer confidence, brand loyalty under the Natera brand. We believe when we add CBD fortification to these lines, consumers who already trust Nat, uh, Natera products will be more inclined to go with a, a manufacturer that they, ha uh, that they recognize. And in addition to that, we are also a contract manufacturing company. And this means we take clients in and we produce their products for them. These clients are in virtually every retailer across Canada, and it's the reputation that these clients have built with their products and their retail distribution channels that will give Naturally Splendid a competitive advantage uh, to launch CBD products as regulations in Canada evolve. Where do you see the CBD market going in Canada and internationally? Actually, we see the CBD market continuing to grow, Jim. The application for CBD is practically endless. Uh, human applications in edibles and topicals. Um, there's pet applications. There's nutraceutical applications. So even as we see more CBD processors come online, we believe demand in Canada, uh, the U.S., and in fact internationally is going to continue to put pressure on supply, which is a great time to be in the CBD fortified product business. Craig, where is Naturally Splendid traded and under what symbols? We trade on the Venture Exchange in Toronto under the symbol NSP. We also trade on OTCQB in the United States, and our symbol in, down in the States is NSPDF. We also trade in Frankfurt, and our symbol there is 50N. How can people get more information about Naturally Splendid? Best place to, to find us is on the website. That's www.naturallysplendid.com. Uh, there's links there to most of our news and our articles, as well as an opportunity to reach out to our corporate communications division. And we'd be happy to answer all those questions. Craig, thanks a lot for the update. Thank you very much for your time today, Jim. We've been speaking with Craig Goodwin, Naturally Splendid President. I'm Jim Goddard. Our conversation took place on February 15th. Comments made on Company Showcase are an expression of opinion only and should not be construed in any manner whatsoever as recommendations to buy or sell any financial instrument at any time. Archived online at HowStreet.com. Company Showcase is a production of How Street Media Incorporated.